Hey CW Apes, Mr. Kennedy here. This is the first of two lectures from Chapter 7 on climate change and weather. Uh, all these videos, again, are available on my YouTube channel. And remember, you can always find uh, PowerPoints on our class webpage anytime. Okay, so one of the things that we need to dive in here in Chapter 7 as we start looking at climate change and weather and all that kind of stuff like that is uh, just the bare bones basics of our atmosphere. What is an atmosphere and how does that translate into weather patterns, climate, how is it changing over time, what effects are we seeing because of people and the things that we're doing, okay? So that's where we're going to start. We're just going to jump right on into what is weather. Weather, when you define it, is anything that is short-lived, local patterns, temperature and precipitation due to just kind of circulation of air in our troposphere. Uh, the troposphere is kind of that layer of the earth where we exist, okay? So if it's short-lived, we call it weather. And I know if you're like me and you're in Fresno during the summer, there's nothing short-lived about those 100-degree days. But in reality, it's only a couple months, right? In terms of climate, climate is a long-term pattern of temperature and precipitation. So if you're going to talk about the fact that it's 110 degrees in Fresno, that's weather. If you're going to talk about the fact that California or Fresno in general has dry heat, um, that's more of a climate thing. Um, it's a long-term pattern of temperature and precipitation. It's relatively dry. There's not a lot of humidity here in California. And uh, well, unless you live right along the coast or someplace other than Fresno, we don't really get a lot of rain. Okay. Your atmosphere is composed up of a number of gases. You probably remember these from previous science classes. Nitrogen gas, the number one component of our atmosphere. Um, believe it or not, you know, a lot of people think it's oxygen, but it's actually nitrogen gas. Uh, makes up about 70% of what you're breathing. And then we've got oxygen gas, some water vapor, and other uh, minute aerosols that are all suspended in that mix. So all these gases, they're moving around under the influence of the convection currents that form due to uneven heating and cooling on the surface of the earth and uh, they give us our weather and as that weather continues to move around and kind of sets into a pattern that's our climate okay another way to define it i put this slide together for you if you want a little bit different look at it what's the difference well again weather is a condition of the atmosphere at a particular time and place just like i said it's 100 degrees outside that's the temperature okay Climate is the average of the weather for a particular area over a certain time. So it's kind of like saying it's 100 degrees today in Fresno um, or Fresno's hot like all the time. OK, um, the last little point there on separating weather for climate from climate is that climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. All right. So from here, we got to look at the uh, zones of the atmosphere. You're going to need this for the different things that we're doing in class. So um, it's good that you get these definitions down. The troposphere is immediately adjacent to the Earth's surface. So like I said a little while ago, that's the part of the like layers of the Earth, like where we live. Okay, It ranges in depth from about 18 kilometers over the equator to about uh, 8 kilometers over the poles. So that means that the thickness of the air um, is fatter at the equator than it is at the poles. Those of you that are fans of physics should probably have an idea as to why that is. Like our planet is spinning, that can create centrifugal forces, gravitational pull. And although we think of air as just kind of being air, well, it actually responds to that and it bulges out in the middle of the planet. Okay. Convection currents redistribute heat and moisture around the globe. Uh, I mentioned convection currents in another lecture where we were learning about how stuff moves through the mantle. Uh, basically, the uneven heating of the Earth's surface causes warm things to rise, like warm air rises, and as it goes higher in the atmosphere, cools off, starts to fall uh, back towards the surface, and it kind of repeats that process. We've got a couple of pictures to show you that in a little bit, right? Air temperatures do drop rapidly with increasing distance from the Earth. So the higher you go, there's kind of a general rule. You lose about two degrees in Fahrenheit temperature per thousand feet that you go up. 
eventually you'll run into this thing called the tropopause. It's the boundary that limits the mixing between the troposphere and the upper atmosphere. Um, air just basically stops going up at that point. All right, next is the stratosphere. From the tropopause up to about 50 kilometers, that's your stratosphere. It has almost no water vapor, but a thousand times more ozone than the troposphere. It's kind of like our UV shield up there. Ozone absorbs ultraviolet light, um, warms the upper part of the stratosphere, protects all life on Earth since UV radiation is bad, and it is being depleted by pollutants that we put up into the atmosphere like freon and bromine. Next is the mesosphere. Mesosphere is the middle layer where the temperature kind of diminishes again, gets a little bit colder, and then the thermosphere, which begins at 80 kilometers up. Here, we basically have nothing but ionized gases and super high temperatures. Um, it's a little bit lower. In the lower thermosphere, we have ions, which when they're struck by like high energy radiation from the sun, um, we get the aurora borealis, or what you guys might have heard of as the northern lights. This is just a little like you know graphic to kind of give you an idea of how the different layers are laid out, basically going from ground level out to outer space. Okay, next we're going to talk about solar energy, right? Um, if you think about this planet, we need to maintain a certain like level of warmth in order for humans to survive. Basically, where does that come from? Well, the sun. Um, of the solar energy that reaches our outer atmosphere, about one quarter of it is reflected by the clouds and the atmosphere. When that is reflected by the clouds, that's a function of the albedo effect of the clouds. So if you have something that is light or white, like clouds are, um, light actually bounces off of that and it'll basically head out back into space. So we lose about a quarter of the solar energy that's striking the earth to the albedo effect from cloud cover. Another quarter is absorbed by carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, ozone, and a few other gases, which adds to our warm temperatures. And then about half of the solar energy that's striking the Earth actually like makes it to the surface. Some of the solar energy uh, is also going to be reflected once it gets to the surface by water, snow, ice, and even sand. If it's light in color, it's going to reflect that solar energy. That's just how it works. Think about wearing a white shirt on a hot day versus a black shirt on a hot day. You wear that black shirt outside on a hot day, you're going to be even hotter. You're going to absorb that solar radiation um, and be extra hot. If you're wearing a white shirt on a sunny day, you reflect that light and it helps keep you cool. Okay. Um, this is just a graphic to help illustrate all of those things that I just gave you. So you can see the solar radiation or the energy from the sun entering at the left. Some of it bounces right off from the albedo effect from the cloud cover. Um, some of it's absorbed by gases in the atmosphere. And then about half of what you had from the sun actually makes it to ground level. Then at ground level, as I said, stuff like snow and ice and the water of the ocean reflects it back up. Only a small portion of the sun's energy that's actually striking our planet actually stays here and adds to our warmth. Just to kind of give you a graphic that helps you understand how things are reflected or absorbed, I put this table in from your textbook. Um, when you get to ground level, fresh snow, dense clouds, water, sand, all that kind of stuff like that, um, they reflect the sun's energy. You can see if I had fresh, like white powdery snow, 85% of the sun's energy or sunlight that hits it um, is reflected back off of that light, uh, off of that surface. Um, you get down to things like the forest, black soil, the earth, um, at, at that point starts to absorb the sun's energy and hold it in and add to our warmth. All right, that brings us to energy in the greenhouse effect, okay? The greenhouse effect is all about keeping this planet warm. Most of the solar energy that reaches the Earth is actually what's called near infrared, and we need that energy to stay warm. If the planet itself were to lose that energy, um, basically it'd be more like the moon, and when this, we entered into night, it would be super freezing, and then in the daytime, uh, ridiculously hot. Okay, so that obviously wouldn't be conducive to our survival. So we need like a greenhouse effect to trap the warmth and also to protect us from like massive temperature swings all the time. Energy emitted by the Earth is mainly far infrared, long wave 
radiation in the form of heat. The longer wavelengths are absorbed in the lower atmosphere and it traps heat close to the Earth's surface, creating kind of a natural greenhouse. A uh, greenhouse is a structure that some of you may even have in, your, or in and around your yards um, that you can grow plants in pretty much year round. We have one out at the environmental pond. It's a natural phenomenon, it's something that's good, and it does help make life possible on this planet. So when you hear the word greenhouse effect, that's not always talking about bad things. Um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are what bless us with this greenhouse effect. The gases in the atmosphere like carbon dioxide, water vapor, the nitrous oxides, methane, um, those all trap this heat energy and help, again, keep us warm. Now, the bad thing about greenhouse gases is if we put, let's say, too much carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere, then we're going to trap extra heat, and that's where greenhouse effects become bad. If we trap more heat than what the planet needs, we bring the planetary temperature up, that's where you hear in the news about things like the ice caps melting and sea levels rising and all that kind of stuff like that. There is a kind of fixed temperature that the planet should maintain in order to kind of keep life where it is right now. And if we, you know, violate that uh, temperature range, that's when we start to see problems. Well, how do we get too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Fossil fuels, number one way. Okay, when we burn fossil fuels, we release extra carbon dioxide or basically release that carbon dioxide faster than it can be taken out of the environment as part of the natural cycle. The only thing that we have in the natural world that actually takes CO2 out of the atmosphere is photosynthesis. Uh, so if we go and chop down forests or worse yet, pollute the oceans, we really put a damper on our ability to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere because we're taking away plants. All right, that brings us to convection. So as I said, lots of heat energy is striking the surface of the earth and that near and far infrared uh, range, and we use that to keep warm. Well, when that solar energy is absorbed by Earth itself, it's used to evaporate water. Um, the energy stored in that water vapor is called latent heat. And as then that water vapor condenses, its heat energy is released. Uh, heat and water are going to move from warmer areas near the equator to colder areas at the pole and redistribute this energy across the entire surface of the planet, starting at the equator and starting in the water. Water does a great job storing this heat energy as it moves through its relative and respective currents throughout the entire surface of the planet. So this is kind of a little map to show you um, where the uh, energy goes and the impact that that energy has uh, on weather. So if you look closely here, you can see we are over here at the equator, right? The equator gets the most direct solar radiation, like it's kind of facing the sun all the time. So like the water's there, you think about them being super warm and all that kind of stuff like that. Um, and as that heat is trapped in the water, right? Warm things rise, warm things go up, that water warms the air above it, that creates warm, moist air above the equator and lots of rain. Well, as that air rises and it rains, okay, and the earth continues to rotate, that air moves north and south respectively, kind of like in a mushroom off the equator as it cools. As it cools and it heads up to about 30 north and 30 south, right, the air starts to fall. And as it falls, since it's dropped all of its moisture at the equator, it's pretty dry air. Now, if you were able to actually follow 30 north all the way around, you'd find that Fresno is not that far off of 30 north, okay? Which might explain why our weather is kind of like what it is, okay? So um, it's kind of, you know, hot and dry around here. We don't get tons and tons of rain. Um, that dry air that fell here at 30 north is going to be pulled back skyward by the upward convection of air that happens again at about 60 north. This up and down movement of air is matched by the circular movement of water on our planet. The, the up and down movement of air creates cells that are named here in this picture, the polar cell, the feral cell, and the Hadley cell. Okay. And that's how we distribute the heat energy and subsequently the moisture across the surface of the earth. So I've got a few um, 
other slides to just kind of give you some more background on those currents. Convection currents, remember we've talked about those, that's where the warm stuff rises and the cold stuff falls. So they are built from the latent heat energy that's absorbed by water at the equator. Warm air close to the equator versus cold air at the poles also produces pressure differences that cause weather. Um, warm air at the equator is rising, so that tends to leave a low pressure system there, right? As the air goes up, low pressure. Um, as the air falls, you get high pressure. So air near the surface warms, becomes less dense than the air above it, it rises. And as it rises above, cooling air um, creates like a vertical convection current. So you get low pressure where your air is rising, you get high pressure where your air is sinking, okay? Low pressure tends to bring rain, high pressure tends to bring hot sunny days. This is just a little illustration to like remind you in a picture form of what I just gave you. So right there over that tree, you've got warm air rising as it rises, it takes moisture with it. Eventually it gets so high up in the atmosphere and cools that that moisture starts to condense and fall as rain. So you got low pressure there over that tree. As that dry air moves laterally, and it's cool, it's cooled down, it's dropped its water load though, it's gonna start falling back to earth, creates a high pressure system and uh, no moisture. So you can see in that illustration why we have deserts and why we have forests where we do. All right, so weather events tend to follow some like general patterns, right? Weather, um, you know, as it occurs across the surface of the earth is not totally random. Physical conditions in the atmosphere like humidity, temperature, air pressure, wind, all that um, occur over short time scales, but things tend to settle into patterns depending upon the angle the earth is at facing the sun, right, and where the earth is in its orbit, okay? Um, so those are things to take into consideration when we're starting to look at weather versus climate. Um, as air rises and falls, it does not rise and fall straight up and straight down. There is this thing called the Coriolis effect that also plays out moving air across the surface of the planet. Also, um, is a little bit of a, a thing of physics because as the planet spins, right, um, there's a gravitational force or pull on this, these columns of air that are rising and falling, which basically is the Coriolis effect. Um, so as it says here, as warm air rises at the equator, it moves northward and sinks and rises in several intermediate bands, forming circulation cells, which I just defined for you, okay? Um, the surface flows, right, do not move straight north or straight south. They're basically deflected due to this Coriolis effect. Um, the curving pattern of the Coriolis effect is caused by the Earth's rotation in an eastward direction, right? So that's what causes the deflection. Winds and currents actually appear to move clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. You might have actually heard that, you know, if you flush your toilet in California, right, then the water is going to go down the toilet in a clockwise manner. But if you go someplace like, you know, South America um, and you flush your toilet, it spins the other way. I've never been to South America, so I can't prove that, but that's what they say. And maybe it's because of the rotation of the planet. Um, this picture is just meant to illustrate what's called the jet stream. Uh, you might see that on the news all the time when we're talking about weather. These are the prevailing winds, if you will, in the northern hemisphere that you can see illustrated here. Um, if you get up in an airplane and you're flying through the jet stream, no joke. These things are like hurricane force winds um, that are traveling in excess of anywhere from 70 to well in excess of 100 miles an hour circulating the globe that affect our um, weather patterns. Now, ocean currents can also affect or modify our weather. Warm and cold ocean currents strongly influence climate conditions on land. As the surface water moves, deep water wells up to replace it, causing deep ocean currents. So basically, ocean circulation is driven by differences in water density, just like the Coriolis effect and um, convection drives, you know, all the stuff that's going on up in the air based on differences in density in the air. 
One thing that's weird about ocean currents is they can shift abruptly. And one of those shifts that we're going to study is what's called El Nino, right? And uh, that's something we're going to spend a lot of time on after we finish uh, this little lecture here, okay? Um, when it comes to rain and comes to weather, hey, many people actually rely on these seasonal rains that are called the monsoons. Um, they bring with them not only copious amounts of water to kind of replenish the land, but kind of mark the start of a growing season um, as they subside. The monsoons are most prevalent in the subtropical and tropical areas. We don't have a monsoon in Fresno. Like I lived here for a very long time and I honestly don't, I couldn't even tell you if Fresno has a rainy season because it just seems to kind of like rain whenever it wants, right? Um, but the monsoon uh, it really is based on the tilt of the earth, right? It's axis and as it changes and goes through seasons, it's going to you know, affect the way the earth faces the sun. Um, that's going to translate into changes in convection currents and ocean currents, and all of that translates into rainy and or dry weather on land. Seasonal rains support our tropical forests. They fill the rivers of the Ganges and the Amazon. Um, they support life, but hey, you know, in the negative world, uh, flooding can also take life away. Um, this just kind of gives you an idea of how monsoons affect uh, India. Right. So heavy rains move across India and basically, like I was uh, explaining to you, replenish the land and uh, and bring with with it, uh, you know, life giving sustenance for for farming. All right. So we're going to get on to uh, the last couple things here to wrap up our look at weather. And uh, this just relates to kind of the stuff that you see on the news, like what's a cold front? What's a warm front? And what does that mean to me? And if it's going to rain or not? Uh, if you have a cold front, cold front is a boundary form when colder air pushes warm air out of the way. Cold air is more dense, tends to hug the ground, push the warm air up. When the warm air is cooled, this could trigger really, really strong thunderstorms. Okay, um, A warm front is basically the opposite. Warm air is less dense, slides over the cool air, and you get kind of like long wedge uh, shaped bands of clouds that form. This maybe can bring days of drizzle, but you're not going to get really, really strong, um, you know, powerful rain out of a warm front. Okay. This just sort of illustrates what the clouds look like and how the air is moving in each of those scenarios. Um, don't worry, you're not going to be tested on the names of the clouds. So you don't have to like memorize like Sirius and Cirrus Stratus and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, one last thing that we got to think about when it comes to weather is sometimes weather can go way bad and we get what are called cyclonic storms. When water vapor is abundant, the latent heat released by condensation can intensify our convection currents and draw more warm air and water vapor into the atmosphere. This creates a storm cell, right? And that storm cell will exist as long as temperature differences exist. That's why we get hurricanes in the Atlantic. There are hurricanes. We're in hurricane season right now, depending on what time of year you're watching this video. Um, you know, Hurricane Katrina is probably one of the most devastating hurricanes to hit the U.S. coast in recent history. Um, horrible, powerful winds, massive storm surge, tens of millions of dollars in damage were done by this hurricane. Um, in the Western Pacific, we get typhoons very similar to hurricanes, right? Um, those typhoons uh, are less common here in the United States as they are throughout the tropics. This is just kind of give you an idea of another type of cyclonic storm. Um, this one over land, so this is a tornado. I used to live in Texas and where California's specialty is earthquakes, well, Texas's specialty is a tornado. And let me tell you, those are something to behold. Uh, swirling funnel clouds over land that can have um, winds in excess of 300 miles an hour that lay waste to anything they come in contact with. They're generated by supercell uh, frontal systems that come in off of the Gulf of Mexico, um, where strong, dry, cold fronts collide with warm, humid air right over the heartland of America. Um, we get great temperature differences in the spring and lots and lots of tornadoes in that area. All right. Um, there's some natural variability to climate. When you think about all this weather stuff, there's some natural variability that we should expect in climate. Climate does change. 
um, but just not as fast as weather does. Um, when we look at the climate of the planet, like we don't expect the planet to have the same climate now as it did 100 years ago or 100 years in the future. Climate can shift on the surface of this earth in response to what we do as humans and what other living things do to the environment. Uh, we can actually collect ice cores uh, from glaciers and actually see climate change over the course of you know decades or centuries. Uh, air bubbles trapped in the ice can be used to analyze atmospheric composition, and uh, we can even find things that are like literally preserved in the ice to kind of give us an idea of what maybe was growing or living in a particular area when the ice formed. So weather changes really, really fast. Climate can change too. It's just not supposed to change really, really fast. It's maybe supposed to take decades or centuries to change um, so that life on Earth can keep up with it. If it changes too fast, then life can't keep up with it. If you're a student of history, you know there have been historical changes in temperature on this planet. We've gone through ice ages. We've gone through tropical periods, right? Right now, as our climate is changing, we are getting warmer. So a lot of scientists think we're on our way for another like tropical period where our polar ice caps kind of retreat and all that. There's a big argument and disagreement on like what will happen to life on Earth as we know it. Sea levels rising and species loss and, and what to do. OK, all of those sorts of things I don't have answers to, um, but we'll figure that out as we go. All right, so that's all I have for you here on weather versus climate and the parts of the atmosphere. Next installment to come, we're going to start talking more specifically about the ocean.